awesome to be with you guys. I uh, love getting to, to come up here and, and share uh, my heart with you guys. And, and just to, to sort of you know, start, start out this way, um, this, what I'm going to talk to you about today has been on my heart for, for really close to a year now. I'm not exactly sure uh, when it, it, it started, but um, about the time, I have, a, I have a year and a half old daughter who is awesome, and, and one of the, her favorite things to do is, is to read books with us. Actually, we read the books to her, but <laughs> the, for us to read books to her, and there's, there's some books, there's the classics that we have, uh, there's the annoying books that you just pr- pray she never takes off the shelves and has have us read over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. But there's also these, these Bible books, and, and the Bible books have always sort of confused me. Because I try to imagine myself as a child who, who maybe has never heard these stories before and, and doesn't know, you know, all the between the lines and uh, all that stuff about these things. And, and we have one in particular that's it's walking through the Bible, and it's telling the Bible in, in these stories. Right, these isolated story after story after story after story. And there's no connection between the stories at all. So you're just reading and like one chapter is, is creation, the next chapter is, you know, um, maybe Adam and Eve, and then you get David and Goliath, and then you, all of a sudden like there's this guy named Jesus on, on the scene, and, and everyone's super happy, and then you turn the page and like, let's kill him, and like, wait, what is going on here? And then Jesus leaves, and then like everything's happy, and like, what? And it's all just disconnected and confusing, and this is sort of like what I grew up in. Uh, I went to a Christian school, and I went to Sunday school. And I, I learned all these individual stories, each having their own principles, each having their own morals, each having their own application that could be drawn from it, but nothing was connected. And so what I wanted to, to do is, for us today is, is start in Genesis and end in Revelation and, and see the connection that, that weaves all of these stories together. To see that these are not just unrelated tales for us, but this is one beautiful story of redemption, a story of a God who desperately wants to be with us, a God that has pursued us throughout all of human history, a God that has let nothing get in the way of, of him being with us. And so we're going to tackle that monumental task today of going through the entire Bible I pray that you uh, don't have anything to do for the next six hours or so. Uh, but that's, where, that's where we'll be here. So text everyone now and say, I'll be late for lunch. Jason's keeping me forever. Pastor Madison's on vacation, so he can't stop me. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, what excites me about this is, is it's the constant reminder that God is never far from us. He's never been far from his creation. He's never forgotten about us. He's never left us on our own, but he's always had a plan for us. And so we're going to be talking about some things today that get pretty exciting. And I know we're not like an amen church, but it's okay to to say amen to what God is doing. First service had this down. Second service was not quite as exciting as first, and you guys are going to make up the difference and like blow them away. So it's okay to say amen, not to what I'm doing, but to what God is doing in this story and to what he has done in your life as well. And so our story is going to begin in the book of Genesis. It's going to begin in the garden, and we're going to see that through the pages of scripture, God has been at work. God is personal. God wants us to know him and he wants to know us. We see a God that pursues and wants to be with his people. The story begins in Genesis chapter 1, and God creates everything out of nothing. Using only his voice, he speaks into existence everything that we can see, everything that we can touch, everything that we can taste. God speaks the physical world into existence. All the galaxies, the stars, the trees, the plants, the animals, everything. And he speaks everything we can't see into existence. He creates emotion and feeling, love. He creates beauty. He creates all of this out of nothing. And the peak of his creation was Adam and Eve. They were uniquely and personally created by this powerful and loving God, and they were placed 
in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 says this, Let us, this is the triune God speaking, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the earth and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Later we see that God blesses them. He calls them good. He gives them responsibility. He was with them. He was their God and they were his creation. And for this brief moment in human history, everything is working as it should. Everything is living in perfect harmony. There is peace. There is unity between God and his creation, God and man. There is unity between God and woman. And there is unity between man and the rest of creation. Everything was as it should be. There was no war. There was no violence. There were no shootings or stabbings. There were no protests. There was no anger. Everything was as it should be. Everything was at peace. Then sin. Adam and Eve grew discontent with the current setup. They were not happy with their place. They wanted to be like gods themselves. Satan uh, comes and tempts them. In Genesis chapter 3, he says, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Imagine the opportunity and the ability to walk side, be, side by side with the Creator in the coolness of the evening breeze. Is there a more beautiful picture than that? But at this moment, because of sin, Adam and Eve find themselves not walking with God, but hiding from his very presence, hiding from the God that created them, hiding from the God that loves them. Sin had driven a wedge between God and his creation, and we've been living with the consequences ever since. When Adam and Eve rebelled against God, the perfect world, the world that was living in harmony, the world at peace was destroyed. Even today, we felt the consequences of sin, work, and childbearing had become difficult. There's tension in all of our relationships. But since the moment sin entered into our history, nothing has been more important for us than regaining God's presence. God being with us once again. As we see God's beautiful plan of redemption unfolding through the pages of Scripture, we see that God is personal, that he wants to know us and be known by us, that he pursues us, that he wants to be with us. He created man to live in the garden with him. And when man destroyed that plan, God set in motion a plan that would span the rest of human history. You see, the Bible is not just a story of our failure and our rebellion. It's not just a story of our sin and our shortcomings, but it's about a, a God that is more powerful than our sin and more powerful than our shortcomings, more powerful than any wedge that can be driven between us. It's a story about a God who wants to redeem us, a God who wants to be with us, a God who loves us and will stop at absolutely nothing to be in right relationship with us. Further on in the book of Genesis, God begins to prove this about himself. He begins establishing covenants with Abraham and his offsprings, saying, I want to be present with humanity. He tells them that he will be their God and he will provide for them blessings, that he will provide for them a land, that he will be with them. And then we turn to the book of Exodus and we see that things have sort of uh, turned out differently than we might have expected. And the Israelites, God's people, the offspring of Abraham, find themselves enslaved to the Egyptians. And for 400 years, they're forced into manual labor. They're living in a land that is not their own, surrounded by false gods who are not their own. And oppressed and desperate, they begin to cry out for help. And the God who is never far, the God who desires to be with them, hears those cries hears those prayers, rises up a leader, 
and says to Moses, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt and have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. And I know about their sufferings. I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The Israelites' cry for help has come to me, and I have also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And in a mighty display of power, God shows that he is unquestionably stronger and more powerful than the Egyptians and their gods. And he sends a series of plagues to to get the Egyptians to relinquish their grip on his people and allow them to be free and allow them to go to the land that he promised to Abraham and his offspring. And so they begin traveling through the desert following Moses and where God wants them to be. And Moses begins to reveal their story to them. You see, the Israelites had just come out of Egypt, but Egypt was still in them. The Egyptian way of living, the constant work, the idolatry, that's the only life that they knew. They knew nothing else for 400 years, generation after generation. That's all they knew. They made bricks with no rest and endured beatings if the quota wasn't met. And when you're in these conditions, you begin to lose track of who you are. You begin to lose track of of your story. I'm sure they would maybe heard whispers of their God and the whispers of their ancestors. But Moses told them the stories of Genesis, along with the rest of the Torah, to remind them why they were there who their God was, and how his promises and plans went back to the very inception of the created order. God wanted the Israelites to know that he was their God. He was a personal and relational God that wanted them to be in his presence. Out of love, he gives them the Ten Commandments and other laws and commands so that they knew how to act in his presence. He would soon set up the sacrificial system so the people would know what to do when their sin separates them from God's presence. So much of what they would have seen as they walked through the desert would have related to the presence of God. After leaving Egypt, they were guided during the day by a cloud, and they were guided by night by a pillar of fire. And the Bible says this is God's presence leading them. They would have seen Moses go to the mountaintop and set up camp, And they would have seen God's presence come down in a cloud and speak with Moses. They would have seen miraculous and powerful things. They would have seen the splitting of the Red Sea. They would have seen God's God's grace and his mercy when they failed and yet he forgives them. They would have experienced a God who, as Exodus says, is a compassionate and gracious God, a God slow to anger and rich in faithful love and truth a God who maintains faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving wrongdoing, rebellion, and sin, and a God who will not leave the guilty unpunished. As we see God's plan of redemption unfolding in each page of Scripture, we see a God who wants us to know him and wants to know us. We see a God that pursues and wants to be with his people, a God that created man to live with him in the garden a God who established covenants to show he wants to be present with us and then gives commands to show us how to act while in his presence. Now, after he freed his people from the Egyptians and gave them commands for how to act, God makes it known to his people that he wants to dwell in their midst. He gives them plans for what is known as a tabernacle, a portable temple, where he will reside. Uh, Exodus 25 says this, they are to make a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell among them. You must make it according to all that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle as well as the pattern of all its furnishings. The, the, the highlight of these furnishings is what is known as the Ark of the Covenant, a two foot by four foot box that was covered in gold. 
Inside were uh, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod and a pot of manna. And its lid was formed of gold and had on top of it two golden angelic statues and their wings stretched towards the center. And this was known as the mercy seat. And this is where God would come down and speak with the priest. This was God dwelling with man. The ark was placed in an inner room known as the Holy of Holies, a 15 foot by 15 foot section that was separated from the rest of the tabernacle by a giant curtain. Even though God desired to be with humanity, there was still the wedge that sin drove between him and us. And because of this, the picture of the curtain was that of a barrier between man and God, showing man that the holiness of God could not be messed with. Sinful man could not be in the presence of a holy God. The curtain separated man from God. Even the high priest, as he entered the temple on the Holy of Holy, uh, entered the temple into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, one day a year had to take meticulous preparations in order to do things right. He had to wash himself, put on special clothing, bring burning incense to let the smoke cover his eyes from a direct view of God. He had to bring blood with him to make atonement for the people's sins. A lot more can be said about the tabernacle, but the important thing is to remember that, that God is now dwelling with man in their camp. He's tabernacling with his people. He's put himself in an incredibly vulnerable and humble position. The infinite God is now living with his finite creation. The creator of all things is living in a tent amongst his people. The wandering nation of Israel with its elaborate temple which housed the presence of God, was a glimpse of what the world ought to be. Here in this moment, at this place, is where heaven and earth collided. And think of the emotion of the Israelite people as they went from hearing faint whispers of who their God was and stories of their ancestors to now having the very God of the universe living in their midst, leading them, guiding them, instructing them. This is a part of God's plan of redemption that unfolds throughout the pages of Scripture. God is personal. He wants to be with them. He wants to know them and be known by them. And when they arrive at the promised land after a 40-year detour because of their sin, God gives permission to King David and Solomon uh, to build the temple a more permanent dwelling place for him, like the tabernacle, but unable to move. It took King Solomon seven years to complete this temple. It was carefully constructed and incredibly elaborate. Gold and fine woods were throughout. And when it was finally completed, Solomon dedicated the temple to God. And we see in a, this beautiful picture, a tremendous celebration and God his presence filling the temple. Just as God's presence resided in the tabernacle, now it resides in the temple. Second Chronicles 7 says, When Solomon finished praying, fire descended from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests were not able to enter the Lord's temple because the glory of the Lord filled the temple of the Lord. He was residing in the Holy of Holies, still separated by that thick curtain. Jewish history tells us that the curtain was four inches thick, a strong reminder that although God wanted to be with his people, it could not, because of sin, be like it was in the garden. The curtain was still there. Whoops. Um, the most significant difference uh, the temple is it, it, it couldn't move. It was there. God was there with his people. And the temple became the center of everything. It became the center of their personal lives, their, their religious lives, their national lives. They literally built the city around it. They, they, they organized their lives around its festivals. But as soon as God's presence descended on the temple, he gave Solomon a warning and he said, I will be in your midst. I will dwell with you. I will be your God so long as you recognize me as your God. 
so long, so long as you follow my commands, so long as you want me there, I will be there living amongst you. But if they reject God, he would leave and they would experience judgment and pain and difficulty. And the Israelites chose false gods rather than the true God. They liked gods that they can control, that they could put in a box, that they could define. And the God of the universe is none of those things. They began to make a mockery of the temple system. They wanted to pursue the gods of the world around them, even though the true God was living in their midst. There's one point where some even began following the god Molech, who called for child sacrifice. Because of their disobedience, the, the kingdom that they established, the once mighty nation that conquered the promised land, began to crumble. And it soon divided and split. And both parts of the kingdom were sent into exiles at different times. And some of the leaders from Jerusalem were sent into exile in Babylon. They were enslaved to a people that worshiped false gods. And at this, right before this judgment, we see the very presence of God leaving the temple. What he said came true that he was there as long as they wanted him there. And the moment they turned their back on him, he would leave. A generation later, after Babylon was overthrown by Persia, some of the Jews were mercifully allowed to, to make their way back to Jerusalem. And, and these, these people had, had learned their lessons, and they wanted to rebuild the wall, and they wanted to rebuild the temple. But it's clear that God isn't there in the same way. The Shekinah glory, as it's called, never seems to return from this period until the, the beginning of the New Testament, the Israelites were left wondering when God will return to them. Can you imagine being there and, and, and coming out of exile back to the homeland, back to Jerusalem, and you're going to rebuild what your, your ancestors had built? And they're building it, and they're building it, and they're excited, and they know the story of, of God's presence filling the temple, and they know the story of fire coming down and consuming the offerings. They know these stories, and they build it, and they dedicate it, and they pray for it, and then nothing happens. His presence isn't there in the same way. And they're left wondering for centuries, when is he coming back? God is a God who is personal, that wants to know us and be known by us. And he will stop at nothing to pursue us. But as we move from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we have to imagine that people began to stop believing that God really wanted to be with them, that he really cared about them, that he really loved them. They heard about it from their ancestors and they read about it in their, their scriptures, but they didn't experience it in the same way. As the years passed, the Israelites would begin to doubt. And at the close of the Old Testament, uh, it's only some of the, the Israelites were, had been allowed to return to Jerusalem, but most of them were still out in exile separated from the things that gave them their identity. Eventually, during the, the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, many of them were able to make their way back. But it's clear that things still weren't the same. They were now under Roman rule and Roman authority. The temple was not the same. It looked, Israel looked nothing like the kingdom it did in the Old Testament. People were confused and lost. Different sects of their religion begin to break off and branch off and separate. And we see the rise of Pharisees and Sadducees and others that have come along and added confusion and chaos to the picture that God is creating. And it's into this confusion when things seemed hopeless and the people of God were, were losing faith that Jesus enters the story. 
God did not forget about his people. He did not run from his people, but he had a greater plan in mind. We begin to see the next chapter unfold in Matthew chapter one. It says this, see the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. This is Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. God wants to be with us, wants to know us, and wants us to know him. He was walking with us in the garden. He was in our midst in the tabernacle and temple, and now he has stepped out of heaven and entered into human history. God became human. God became one of us to live amongst us. John says it this way, The word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. The word for residence here literally means tabernacled. A powerful picture that that just like God was with the Israelites in the tabernacle, now he was with his people in Jesus. This was God's plan from the beginning. We see the first hints of it all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. People had been waiting for the glory of God to to return to the temple or, or like it was in the tabernacle. But John 1 is saying loud and clear that God himself is dwelling amongst us. Jesus's body is now where heaven and earth collide. The temple system reaches fulfillment. It was always meant to point to something else, something greater, always meant to point to Jesus. And now the glory of God had returned in the person of Jesus. That was an amen moment. (laughs) With us. And no one experienced that more intimately than the disciples. The 12 men who were chosen by Jesus to, to follow him during his years of public ministry. To see him. To live with him. To eat with him. To listen to his teachings. Can you imagine what it would be like to hear the Sermon on the Mount live? To be there as the people are gathered, and he begins to, to, to teach this, this sermon that is groundbreaking and life-changing and to experience it live. The sermon that so many books have been written on and sermons have been preached about and lives have been changed because to listen to those words come out of the Savior And then to be with him and see him heal the sick, to see him walk on water, to see him feed thousands with only a few loaves of bread and fish, to be there the moment he says, Lazarus, come forth, and to see a dead man come back to life at the word of Jesus. Can you imagine being one of the disciples and being called by Jesus and following him and and understanding soon that he's not just a great teacher. He's not just a wonder-working prophet. But this man in their midst is God. Emmanuel, God with us. And although we may think this may be a good place to, to put the finish line. We may think that this is poetic and beautiful, and just like God was walking with Adam and Eve in the garden, so Jesus is walking with man here thousands of years later. It's not the finish. And although we might be sitting here today and thinking, wow, like how incredible it would be to have God in our midst, many of the people rejected Jesus. They didn't want him to look how he looked and act how he acted and say the things he was saying. They wanted a God, a Savior, a Messiah. They could put in a box. They wanted a king, a warrior. They wanted someone to do the things that they wanted done, someone to come with a sword and to destroy their oppressors to lead the nation of Israel back to a great nation. 
to take them out of Roman rule. And they rejected the teachings of the carpenter's son who talked about love and grace and a different kind of kingdom. As we read through the Gospels, we can see there's a shift that begins to take place. And people once celebrated Jesus, and now they seem to be turning against him and hating him and attacking him. And we know what's coming, and we see it happening. And then Jesus begins to to speak about it. And he says to his disciples, Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed, and rise after three days. Can you imagine being one of the disciples and hearing that? The man who you were beginning to believe was was the God of the universe, here in your midst, Emmanuel, God with us. And he says, I'm going to die. I'm going to leave you. But this is what needed to happen. This is the next step in God's plan. Before Jesus was was born, an angel declared that he would save his people from their sins. The problem of sin had threatened humanity's relationship with God ever since Adam and Eve's disobedience in the Garden of Eden. In order for God's people to be in right relationship with him, sin had to be paid for. It had to be atoned for. All the sacrifices that God's people made in the Old Testament pointed towards the perfect sacrifice that Jesus would make on the cross. He was willing to surrender himself, endure the beatings and the unfair trials, and sacrifice himself on the cross so that we could have life through him. So the sin that drove the wedge between us, could be re- between us and God could be removed. Moses records the last moment of Jesus' life in this way. Moses, did I say Moses. Matthew, Jesus shouted again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary, the curtain of the temple was split in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And they came out of the tombs after his resurrection, entered the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they were terrified and said, this man really is God's son. Jesus died for us. Our sins were paid for and the wrath of God was satisfied in his death. But something else incredible happens here. Matthew says in verse 51, the curtain of the sanctuary was split in two from top to bottom. The curtain that that separated man from, from God, creator from his creation, was torn in two. God will stop at nothing to be with us. He he created us to walk in the garden with him. And when we sinned, he didn't let sin have the final say. But he stopped at nothing to be with us. He heard the cries of the Israelites. He gave plans for a tabernacle and a temple so he could dwell amongst them. He wanted to be with his creation, so much so that he entered into human history as Jesus. And then died to pay the price, to remove the wedge, so that we can be in perfect relationship with him once again. And at that moment, at the crucifixion, this this curtain was not torn by accident. This is not a coincidence that this four-inch thick curtain was ripped from top to bottom. This is God saying loud and clear, I want to be with you. And because of the death of Jesus, we don't need the Holy of Holies. We don't need a high priest. We don't need the temple system. I can be with you because his death paid for your sins. I can be with you. God moved out of the place that was created by human hands and he would never again dwell in a place that was made by us. The temple and Jerusalem were left desolate. 
And a few decades later, the Romans would come and destroy it all. But God wasn't there anymore. After the crucifixion, Jesus was removed from the the cross and placed into a tomb, but that's not where his story ends. The most beautiful word in all of Christianity, I believe, is resurrection. And because of the resurrection, I know that what Jesus said is true. I know that the veil being torn was not an accident. I know that he actually really literally conquered sin, death, and Satan. I know that my sins are paid for because of the resurrection. I know that he has not forgotten me, that he has not abandoned me, that he is not without a plan because of the resurrection. As we see God's plan of redemption unfolding with each page turn in Scripture, we see a God who is personal, a God who wants to be known by us and know us. We see a God who pursues and wants to be with his people. We see a Savior who died for our sins so that we can be in right relationship with God once again. After the resurrection, Jesus spends some time with his disciples and he's teaching some more. And then he leaves. The God who was once in their midst, walking with them, teaching them, instructing them, answering their questions, performing miracles, leaves. Acts 1 says, After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was... While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Jesus is is gone, but Jesus had told his disciples this day would come, but he would not leave them by themselves. He says, or he told them earlier in John 14, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. A few chapters later in John 16, he says, Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I leave, that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. Jesus leaves, but the story does not end there. We have seen from uh, the history of Israel and the history of uh, even our own lives that we cannot do the things that God asks us to do without his spirit, without him indwelling us. And so that's what God has chosen to do. This is our chapter, the chapter that we are living in right now. This is where we come into the story. See, this Holy Spirit showed up in Acts chapter 2, but he is available to all of us who believe. He is God living inside of us, the same God that walked with Adam and Eve, the same God that dwelt in the tabernacle in the tent, the same God who was Jesus, that God is living inside of each and every one of us who believes. God is still with us. God knew this is what we needed. He knew this is what the Israelites needed in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 36 uh, says this, I will also sprinkle water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. What we need is the spirit of God, we need to be changed from the inside out, empowered by the very presence of God. Like, can you imagine uh, hearing this and, and, and knowing this and, and knowing that, that, that this God who once caused a man to fear at the base of Mount Sinai when he spoke to Moses on the mountaintop, the same God who caused people to, to fall on their faces as his, as his glory filled the temple. This God wants to take up residence to live in us as believers. 
how could this happen? How could a perfect and holy, just God live inside of broken human beings? And the answer goes back to Jesus. Jesus paid for our sins and removed that wedge between us and God. Our sins were nailed to the cross and we have imputed the righteousness of Jesus. This allows God to dwell inside of us. See, we weren't there in the garden. We weren't, we weren't led by a pillar of cloud or fire. We never saw what it was like when God was in the, in the tabernacle of the temple. We weren't there walking beside Jesus, learning from him. But what we have is even greater. Jesus was beside Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He was separated by a curtain in the tabernacle in the temple. He was only here as Jesus for 33 short years. But in each and every one of us who believes, God is always there, always present as the Holy Spirit. He's always at work in us. Always at work in our life, always molding us, always shaping us. He's there when you're doing great and awesome and following him faithfully. And he's also there when you're struggling and you're tempted and you're hurting and you're broken. He never stops working. In the moments where you feel like you're drowning, you feel like you can't do it. You feel like you're all alone and you've been forgotten and you've been left. You have to remember that you are never far from God because if you believe, he is dwelling inside of you. The same God from the Old Testament, the same God of such power and wisdom and grace and love is dwelling inside of you. And we need to live according to the Spirit. It is absolutely essential for us to complete the mission that we've been given uh, to have the Holy Spirit. Unless the Spirit... Uh, the Spirit gives us power to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. He is there in our needs. He is there to comfort us. When the rest of the world forgets about us, He is there. When we need encouragement and no one has the right words to say, He is there. When we are weak and we cannot find the strength to do what needs to be done, He is there, always with us. We are commanded to walk by the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, pray in the Spirit, put to death the misdeeds of the body by the Spirit. The Spirit secures our our faithfulness till the end. Even the assurance that we are God's children comes from the testimony of the Holy Spirit. But we're still not done. It's still another chapter. We still have heaven to look forward. We are called to live and faithfully follow Jesus in the midst of this sin-stained world, but we also have the sweet promise that it won't be like this forever. We turn on the news and we see the world that has been devastated. But this isn't our final place. This isn't where we were meant to live. God's plan is, is still in motion. His plan to be with us. It's never been in jeopardy. There has never been any doubt about how history will end. This is God's world. He created it. He vowed to reclaim it. He died to purchase his people. And finally, when the time arrives, he will come and take the world by force. And as we turn to the last pages of Scripture, we will see that he will establish a new creation. The creation will be restored. We see in the new heaven, in the new earth, and there's a, there's a new Jerusalem. And we'll see that there's, there's no need for a temple. And John says this in Revelation, I did not see a sanctuary in it, because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its sanctuary, its temple. Everything about the old creation that has been marred by sin and death will be no more. For God has made all things new. The new creation will be full of such joy that it seems difficult for us to fathom or understand. We can put our heads down on our pillows at night and just dream about what heaven will be like. And it's only scratching the surface of its, of its beauty and of its perfection. But make no doubt about it, the best thing about heaven is not the streets paved with gold, is not the mansions that are crafted and created personally for us by Jesus. 
the greatest feature of the new creation is that we will have perfect relationship with God. John says it this way in Revelation 21, look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And that word for dwelling, guess what word it is? Tabernacle. To be with us once again. We have a God that pursues us, a God that loves us, a God that is never far from us. A God is there, is always there in our darkest needs, always there when we need him. A God that has not forgotten us, a God that wants to know us and wants us to know him. And he has proved himself by pursuing mankind throughout all of human history. He has never let anything get in the way of his plan. He's always conquered anything that tries to set foot between us and him. He has done whatever it takes to remove the wedge between us and him. And so where we're at now, we can live in the power of the Spirit, longing for a future where we can physically see our holy God dwelling amongst us. Let's pray. God, thank you for being who you are being a God that has not let our wickedness and sin forever separate us from you. But you're a God who has pursued us, a God that has chased after us even when we were running from you. Thank you for being a God who has empowered us with the Spirit, a God that is living inside of us here and now. Thank you that we don't have to pray like David did, that your spirit won't leave us. God, thank you for the promise of heaven. And we look forward to dwelling with you there. In Christ's name, amen.